All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for being here. Um, on behalf of the Wilson Center Africa Program, I would like to welcome you all today as we examine the conflict in South Sudan uh, and take a look at the mediating role of the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, or EGAD, um, and look at the prospects and implications for future international engagement. Um, as you may have noticed, I am not Dr. Mande Munyangwa, our director. Um, she's there in the back. Um, I'm Elizabeth Ramey. I'm the program associate here at the Africa Program, and I'll be moderating today's session. Um, as you're all aware, uh, the ongoing conflict in South Sudan was ignited in December of 2013 um, by a political struggle between President Salva Kiir and his former Vice President Riek Mashar. Since then, 10,000 people have been killed, 700,000 refugees have fled the country, and 1.6 million more have been internally displaced. EGAD has played a key role in brokering ceasefire agreements, drafting a proposed power sharing agreement, and monitoring the situation. But unfortunately, peace has remained elusive, and continued violence threatens the survival of this young country, which, as we all know, just celebrated its fourth anniversary of independence. I think this event comes at a particularly important time uh, with some tough language from President Obama and the U.S. Special Envoy for Sudan and South Sudan about the need to adhere to the August deadline set um, with EGAD. Uh, so we'll be curious to hear the thoughts of our speakers on Obama's recent statements and the reaction of EGAD's partners to those comments. Um, before we continue, I'd like to welcome a few guests that are present today, uh, including several members of the African Diplomatic Corps, um, Friends at State, USAID, and a number of other agencies that are working on this issue. We welcome you all. Uh, for those who might be unfamiliar with the Wilson Center, um, we were established in 1968 by an act of Congress. So unlike those stuffy monuments on the mall, we're actually a living memorial to President Woodrow Wilson, uh, who had an enormous influence on the international policy of the United States. Uh, today, the Wilson Center provides a safe political space where the worlds of policy and scholarship interact. Uh, we do this through public events, as well as timely and relevant research to address critical and emerging issues confronting the United States and the world. The Wilson Center follows events on the, the ground in Africa very closely, and in fact, our director, Dr. Muyangwa, was just on the ground with the U.S. delegation um, at the Global Entrepreneurship Summit in Nairobi. Um, so we uh, work very hard to address the key issues that are impacting Africa and U.S.-Africa relations. Uh, we also, in this effort, try to bring African voices and perspectives, uh, those of scholars and practitioners, as well as leaders from the public and private sphere, uh, to bear on these issues. So the Africa program itself was founded in 1999, and it really expanded under the leadership of the late Howard Wolpe, who I think many of you knew. Um, today, the program centers its work on four pillars, inclusive governance and leadership, conflict prevention and peace building, trade, investment, and sustainable development, and Africa's evolving role in the global arena. Uh, our event today features uh, one of our visiting scholars from our Southern Voices Network. So I'll just give you a quick background on the Southern Voices Network. Um, it's a consortium of 16 research and policy organizations across Africa that seek to foster dialogue and increase the visibility of African perspectives within the U.S. policy arena. So one of the main components of the SVN is a research scholarship program uh, through which uh, the Africa program hosts scholars from our member organizations for a three-month resident scholar program here in Washington, D.C. The scholarship provides opportunity for select individuals to complete a policy research project and engage with U.S. policymakers and practitioners. Uh, this increases the visibility of their work, um, but also brings local context and knowledge into the U.S. policy arena. So with that, I would like to introduce our SVN scholar, Dr. Getachu Zeru Gebrekeden. Uh, Dr. Getachu is an assistant professor in peace and security studies at the Institute for Peace and Security Studies of Addis Ababa University in Ethiopia. He has prior experience as a visiting scholar and guest researcher at the Institute of African Studies, I'm gonna say this wrong, but at the Jiang Normal University? <laughs> in China, um, and the Danish Institute for International Studies in Copenhagen, Denmark. Uh, Dr. Gatachu has published three journal articles, one book chapter, and a book manuscript. He has also served as a lecturer at the College of Law and Governance at Merkel University in Ethiopia. He holds a PhD in Peace and Security Studies, an MA in International Relations, and a BA in Political Science and International Relations from Addis Ababa University. We are also privileged to be joined by Mr. John Prendergast, who 
hardly needs an introduction, but I will give one anyway. Uh, he's a human rights ad, uh, activist and a best-selling author who has worked for Peace in Africa for 30 years. He's the founding director of the Enough Project, which is an initiative to end genocide and crimes against humanity. And he is the co-founder co -founder of The Century, um, which is a new investigative initiative focused on dismantling the network's financing, conflict, and atrocities. Uh, it's very interesting, so I would recommend you ask him about it after. Uh, Mr. Prendergast has worked for the Clinton White House, the State Department, two members of Congress, the National Intelligence Council, UNICEF, Human Rights Watch, the International Crisis Group, and the United States Institute of Peace. Uh, during his time in government, uh, Mr. Prendergast was a part of the facilitation team behind the successful two-year mediation, which ended the 1998-2000 war between Ethiopia and Eritrea. Uh, he was also part of the peace processes for Burundi, Sudan, and Congo, and helped direct the Sudan Now campaign, which supported the holding of a peaceful referendum for South Sudan. So I would like to thank, uh, um, I would like to invite everyone to join me in welcoming our speakers today. Um, for those of you who use social media, um, you can uh, tweet along with us uh, using the hashtag EGAD. Uh, our Twitter handle is at Africa Up Close. Uh, and you have the, um, the Twitter handles for all of the speakers on your handout as well, if you would like to uh, tweet their remarks. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over first to uh, Gitachu, and then we will go to John Prendergast. Take it away. Uh, thank you, Liz. Uh, uh, just uh, first let me take this opportunity to thank the African program of Wilson Center for hosting me for the last three months as African research scholar. Uh, I also want to appreciate for all of you for being here to listen to uh, my presentation. Uh, with this, uh, let me keep in touch with uh, the topic uh, as uh, Liz stated. Uh, I'm going to uh, present uh, IGED's uh, mediation role uh, in the South Sudan uh, conflict with particular emphasis to the regional security complex where uh, the member states are not able to unify to resolve the problem of South Sudan. Uh, my presentation has uh, three uh, parts. <coughs> the first one is trying to look at the overview of uh, the conflict and then uh, uh, try to see the intricacies of the IGAD lead peace process, and finally uh, come up with recommendation from a uh, policy perspective. Uh, <coughs> as you can see from uh, uh, the picture, I think the conflict is almost uh, between these two guys. Uh, obviously, uh, South Sudan uh, uh, is one of, I think, the youngest country in the world uh, that succeeded in uh, 2011 based on the 2005 comprehensive peace agreement between uh, the government of Sudan and today's government of South Sudan, uh, which was uh, previously called as SPLM. Uh, of course, this agreement uh, ended the one of the longest civil war in Africa, uh, which cost us uh, more than two million lives and also so the South Sudan people, when South Sudan became independent, were hoping a new life in the new country uh, with peace and security, political and, and economic development. However, you know, after two years of its independence, uh, the country reverted into uh, a pervasive civil war that uh, cost us uh, in, in thousands of uh, days in displacement and uh, destructions of the country. Uh, I think from this we can uh, clearly imagine that how the conflict is devastating uh, in terms of human and material resources. Uh, some researchers uh, indicated that the conflict is ethnic-based conflict. However, I believe that ethnicity is, it is a driving, it's not a driving force, rather it is a power struggle between these two, uh, two uh, big persons in South Sudan. But they are trying to use ethnicity as an instrument either to sustain power or to gain political and economic power in, in South Sudan. Therefore, because of uh, the struggle for power between these uh, people, 
Uh, I think the country is plugged into a very pervasive and profound civil war, profound political crisis. So this, I think because of the war, the country is burning, the people are dying, people are displacing from, from their uh, home country to neighboring countries. Uh, apart from uh, the power struggle, uh, I can see that uh, there are some other uh, underlining causes of conflict in South Sudan, which are very important uh, in, in equally with power struggle in, in the country. One is corruption, patronage, and impunity. Uh, obviously, there is high rate of uh, corruption and patronage in the country. Uh, uh, even if you see some of the reporters uh, coming from Transparency, Transparency International, uh, so South Sudan is the worst uh, corrupt country in the world. And uh, the other important uh, underlining cause of the current conflict in South Sudan is uh, lack of effective uh, demobilization, uh, disarmament, and reintegration, including uh, problem of uh, security sector reform, where uh, the country is highly militarized with a huge number of arms in the wrong hands. And those arms are now uh, killing peoples in South Sudan. Those ammunition are now uh, displacing the people of South Sudan into different parts of the neighboring countries. Uh, apart from uh, lack of effective DDR and uh, CSR, weak institutional capacity with excessive military principles can be called as the other underlying cause of the problem. Uh, here you cannot see uh, the difference between the military and uh, the, the party. You cannot see the difference between the party and the government. Uh, so I think this, this can also be taken as a serious problem in, in the South Sudan uh, conflict. Uh, the last one is a lack of mechanism to promote check and balance among and between the various branches of government, uh, the judiciary, the executive, and the legis legislative branches of government in South Sudan. Therefore, in general, apart from the power struggle uh, in South Sudan, those are some of the major underlying causes for the recent uh, conflict in South Sudan. Uh, the other important point that we have to look at is the immediate or the uh, incidents of the South Sudan conflict. Uh, it's obviously known that there was uh, a tension within the ruling party long before the eruption of the civil war. For example, you can see that the former vice president was sacked in July 2013. Uh, some military generals were dismissed. Uh, some uh, governors of states were sacked, and also uh, uh, key officials were sent to prison. So this, this were, I think, some of the clues uh, from which anyone can uh, predict that a civil war would happen uh, in South Sudan one day. Uh, this uh, long tension ex uh, exploded in June, uh, especially in, in Juba in December 15. 2013 and expanded to the other parts of uh, South Sudan, uh, particularly to Jongle, uh, the Upper Nile, and Unity Status. Uh, this basically uh, further disintegrate the national uh, army of the country, uh, from which we can uh, have the SPLM in opposition, uh, which became a rebel group in South Sudan and now challenging uh, uh, the government. Uh, when we look at the uh, impacts of the conflict, uh, basically uh, there is a huge human rights violation in the country. Uh, that includes this uh, extrajudicial killing, arbitrary arrest and detention. Uh, there is rapes and other forms of uh, 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 sexual violences. For example, if you look at the reports of uh, the International Crisis Group, uh, more than 50,000 people have been killed. Uh, more than 1.5 million people are now internally displaced, uh, according to especially the report of the United Nations. And also we have more than 700,000 people uh, who are refugees in the neighboring countries, in Uganda, in Ethiopia, in Kenya, and in Sudan. Uh, again, you can see uh, different types of attacks in the country. You can see attacks in the church. You can see attacks in 
uh, the mosque, in schools, and even in the United Nations uh, compounds. Therefore, uh, we can uh, imagine that how much it is very worse, uh, the civil war, especially on the civilians of South Sudan. The, the other important impact is the uh, abduction and recruitment of child soldiers. Uh, the child soldiers are on both sides of the conflicting parties. It's not only the violation of the child rights, but also even the child themselves are involved in crimes against humanity. They are involved in raping. They are involved in unnecessary activities in South Sudan. Therefore, we can see from both sides, not only violating the rights of the child, but also the child themselves are violating the rights of the other people because of, because of the war and uh, the conflicting parties. Uh, this, the, the, when we look at, especially from economic perspective, uh, I think because of the civil war, South Sudan, uh, especially the economy of the South Sudan has been devastatingly uh, destroyed from time to time, given the fall in global oil prices uh, and the turn uh, down in oil uh, production, especially in the conflicting uh, areas of uh, the, 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 the country. Uh, at the same time, uh, the, uh, this, this, this civil war has negatively affected the economy of the neighboring countries, the Uganda, uh, the uh, Kenya, Sudan, and Ethiopia to some extent. And therefore, uh, we can say that uh, the, the, the uh, civil war of uh, South Sudan is not only uh, uh, a problem to the South Sudan people, but also it is a problem to the neighboring countries in terms of politics, in terms of social, as well as in terms of economies. Even it is a problem to the international community uh, we are ex that, that are expected to allocate money to resolve the problems of the refugees that are found in different parts of uh, the neighboring countries. Therefore, uh, the, the impact is very uh, pervasive, especially in the lives of the South Sudan, as well as to some extent in the lives of the neighboring countries. When we come to the uh, intricacies of the eager lead peace process, uh, which is really very important in this uh, particular session, uh, one important point is that you know the members of IGAD are not unifying their armies to resolve the problem of South Sudan. Uh, as you can see from the conflict mapping, uh, the actors are almost six for this uh, specific presentation. One, South Sudan uh, versus SPLM in opposition. The other one is we can have Uganda. Uh, versus the Lord Resistance Army. We have Sudan Revolutionary Front, uh, which is a coalition of different rebel groups of Sudan. And ha we have also the Sudan government itself. Now, when we try to see the channel, uh, Uganda has been fighting alongside South Sudan against SPLM in opposition. And at the same time, there is a legation that Uganda has been providing assistance to Sudan Revolutionary Front through South Sudan. On the other side, Sudan has been providing, that's a legation that's providing some kind of training and armament to SPLA and opposition. And Uganda is criticizing Sudan for providing assistance to Lord Resistance Army. And therefore, this kind of complex relationship by itself has created a problem in South Sudan itself. This is a kind of proxy war within the land of South Sudan. So this, this creates a big problem and challenge for IGAD to resolve the problems of South Sudan. Uh, apart from this, uh, again, uh, there is a problem related to uh, inclusiveness and comprehensiveness. I believe that IGAD is uh, in, in, in a problem to include the important, other important peoples in South Sudan. For example, uh, it doesn't give more attention to the women's association, to the civil society organization, to the church, who can play a very important role in resolving the problems of South Sudan. Uh, it, it, it doesn't give even attention to the the opposing parties in South Sudan. And therefore, it gives more emphasis uh, mainly to the two teams, the, the president and the former vice president, and to New Year, to the other side, and to that of Dinka, 
which is really a uh, very serious uh, problem if we are thinking about solution in South, in South Sudan. Therefore, it, it failed to provide space for active participation of other South Sudanese uh, people on the ground who can play a very important role, especially in, uh, in, in bringing peace in that specific country. Uh, when you look at the role of Kenya and Ethiopia, uh, relatively, I think they are uh, neutral. However, they couldn't exert. They couldn't exert. their just, just, just you know, to bring Sudan and Uganda to the normal peace process. They couldn't influence. They couldn't, uh, you know, able to uh, influence them to stop destabilizing the country because of their own major reasons that I believe. For example, Ethiopia uh, is now focusing on its own national agenda, like the uh, Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. Therefore, in order to not get some kind of destabilization from Sudan and Uganda, it's not pressing both countries to stop their destabilizing role. This is uh, one of the major challenge that uh, uh, Ethiopia couldn't do at this level. And the, th the, th the other one is Kenya. Kenya is now fighting to the terrorist uh, groups who are just you know, creating some kind of destabilization within the country. And therefore, uh, it gives more priority to its own national agenda rather than trying to you know, halt or use uh, strong words and powers to stop the roles of Uganda and Sudan in, in South Sudan. Uh, therefore, I think uh, even though they are uh, neutral and playing their own role, but still uh, I couldn't see that uh, they use their own power in terms of influencing the other regional powers from destabilizing uh, South Sudan. The, the other one is the uh, African Union. Uh, basically, uh, to me, African Union is not playing an important role in resolving the problems of South Sudan. Uh, when the African Union uh, uh, come up with the Constitutive Act, which enables to intervene in the internal affairs of its member states, uh, including to use power, uh, I was thinking that African Union can use power to resolve the problems of South Sudan. But now, so the African Union is just simply talking rather than just using arms to stop the problem of South Sudan. It has. The, the, the capacity to use power, it has the legitimacy to use power according to the Constitutive Act, according to the uh, thumb, thumb articles of the African Union Peace and Security, but still it's not playing an important role in terms of you know, uh, uh, putting its, 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 its strong hand to resolve the problems of uh, South Sudan. Even the African Union uh, is not able to implement what it designed uh, like the African uh, uh, Commission of Inquiry to investigate the problems of Sudan uh, by the former uh, president of uh, Nigeria, uh, which is now uh, the report is shelved, which is not uh, functional in terms of you know, dealing with the problems of South Sudan people. Therefore, I believe that the African Union uh, has not been playing an important role to resolve the problems of uh, South Sudan. Uh, the, the, the last one is uh, about this policy recommendation. Uh, basically, uh, I tried to come up with uh, my recommendation not only to the IGAD, uh, but also to the other uh, actors in, 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 in South Sudan. For example, I believe that the IGAD Plus, which includes the United States of America, uh, Norway, England, China, the UN, and African Union should try to redesign the, 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 the uh, approaches in, 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 in resolving the problems of uh, South Sudan. For example, they need to be uh, inclusive. They have to try to look at the interests of the other South Sudanese people, not only the uh, Machar and uh, Kir. Uh, and the second one is uh, they need to employ holistic institutional reform because there is a problem in the military, there is a problem in the civil, so civil service, there is a problem in security, there is pro a problem in the judiciary, and therefore unless there is some institutional reform uh, which has to be incorporated in the IGAD peace process, 
uh, it would be very difficult to see sustainable peace and security in the area. And the other important point is uh, try to devise and apply hybrid justice mechanism. Uh, because we are talking about the days of more than 50,000 people. Uh, so it's, there is a need of reconciliation. There is a need of uh, healing. There is a need of truth-telling. Therefore, hybrid justice mechanism is very important uh, with, with advice and the training of uh, giving from the, the other partners. Uh, we have to also give more emphasis to the encouragement of frequent discussion and cooperation among the members of IGAD Plus. Not only living issues for IGAD, but also the other international partners should actively play. And they have to discuss and they have to look uh, over the major uh, problems that are uh, still facing the, uh, the, the IGAD's role in resolving the problem of South Sudan. Therefore, there must be a cooperation, not only within uh, the IGAD uh, member states, but also within the international uh, partners of uh, IGAD. Uh, again, I believe that uh, sanction and military intervention is very important. People are dying every day. So to stop this uh, military intervention to some extent is very essential. Uh, we can see, for example, in Cote d'Ivoire, uh, especially to contain the problem, uh, the, the role of uh, military intervention, not by IGAD member states, rather by the African Union, is, will, 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 will be very uh, important, especially in containing the problem. Uh, the other important point that we have to give emphasis is uh, to initiate a peace dialogue between, uh, between Uganda and Sudan. Because those two countries uh, have been playing negative role in the roles of IGAD, and therefore uh, uh, we have to try to capitalize the previous peace dialogues initiated by the Carter Center in 1999, which was very important, especially to bring uh, the two countries to the discussion to to to, to stop destabilizing each other. Uh, so that uh, that will be uh, very important uh, for the South Sudan as well. Uh, I also uh, suggest that uh, they, both countries should be excluded. Sudan and Uganda should be excluded from UGAD, IGAD peace team. I'm not saying from IGAD, but from IGAD, IGAD peace team uh, dealing with the South Sudan issue. Because they have their own special interests in that in that specific country. Therefore, they need to be excluded. Even last time, I remember that President Obama hosted, uh, invited uh, Uganda and also Sudan. In other words, they are part of the IGAD team. But at the same time, they are destabilizing the country. Therefore, I believe that those countries should be excluded from, you know, uh, from the IGAD uh, uh, peace team uh, in relation to the South Sudan. And the other one is uh, it has to be uh, dis dismantled, especially indiv individualization of power in South Sudan, because now the power is uh, between two individual leaders. It has to be uh, come down to the people on the ground. Power should, should be, should be uh, in the hands of the majority community rather than two individuals who are struggling to sustain or to maintain their power. Therefore, uh, I think these are from IGAD's perspective. Whereas when we look at from the, from the IGAD member countries' uh, perspective, uh, Uganda, Sudan, and Kenya should look for long-term economic uh, perspective or uh, cooperation with South Sudan. Uh, I think uh, Sudan and, and Uganda are negatively playing their role. As I said before, Kenya should press to the members of IGAD countries who are, pro who are creating problems in South Sudan, uh, either in, in, different, in, 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 in different mechanisms. I think that will be very uh, important. And Ethiopia should also use the, uh, the friendly relationship uh, should exploit the friendly relationship with Uganda and, and, and Sudan. Now Ethiopia is a friend of Uganda and at the same time a, a friend of uh, Sudan. Therefore, it has to change it to positive results in the case of South Sudan conflict, rather than just retreating uh, for fear of destabilizing their own, uh, its own uh, national agenda. Uh, and the other one is the African Union uh, should fully and actively involve it 
as well as try to use its principles uh, of non-indifference, uh, especially to intervene in the internal affairs of countries uh, where the people are suffering because of the war. Therefore, uh, military intervention by the African Union is very essential uh, with the help of uh, other uh, actors. Uh, when I come to the uh, uh, recommendation, especially to the U.S., uh, to, to some extent, I think the U.S. should uh, fully and actively involve it in the IGAD Plus uh, discussion because U.S. is part of IGAD Plus. If that is the case, I think it has to play a very important role because we can see that the U.S. had played in the CPA of 2005, and therefore it has to show that commitment, especially in this case as well. And uh, hold active discussion with China, uh, uh, particularly in trying to deal the problems of South Sudan. Because China is uh, it's the best friend of uh, uh, Sudan, and U.S. and Uganda have been working together, especially in relation to security in the Horn of Africa, and therefore they have to discuss because they can play an important role in trying to uh, influence uh, the, the, the games of uh, Uganda and Sudan. Therefore, U.S. and China have to discuss uh, the, about the security issues, particularly in South Sudan. And they have to exert strong leverage on IGAD Plus uh, to include a holistic institutional reform in the military sector, in the civil service sector, in the security sector, uh, and, and other uh, important uh, issues. And the other one is uh, the, they need to take firm action, a firm action. Uh, it could be military action, or it could be strong sanction, particularly the top leaders of the, the, the top leaders who are fighting uh, in, in that specific uh, country. And also promote swift action oriented strategy, uh, such as military intervention. Uh, of course, in, in, uh, there is a deadline, August 17, especially, uh, uh, which was given by uh, IGAD uh, and the U.S. Uh, but I think that would be very difficult unless it is supported by action. Uh, almost after two weeks, that, that date will be uh, coming. And then, but I think I believe that they need to use a very strong measure in terms of stopping their uh, destructive uh, activities. And also the U.S. should encourage uh, peace dialogue between Sudan and Uganda. Uh, as I said, uh, the U.S. was the one who was, uh, you know, especially through the Carter Center, initiated this, this dialogue. And therefore, this is very important, particularly to resolve the problem of uh, uh, South Sudan. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I will meet you later after this case. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gatachu, for these uh, rich insights um, into the internal regional dynamics in EGAD, um, and also for your robust set of recommendations for international partners. Um, I really liked your diagram. Um, sort of mapping out the, this web of tense relations and, and material support within the process. Um, so now for a uh, U.S. perspective, um, we're going to turn to Mr. Prendergast, who has worked in virtually every relevant policymaking office or with them uh, on this issue. So take it away. All right. Thanks, Liz, for having us. And thanks, Katachi, for the, good, the great overview uh, for all of us. Um, very comprehensive. And I'm looking at this stage here uh, with a moderator. You know, it reminds me of the of the upcoming presidential debates, debates. So if only we could be so interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Will you or I be the Donald Trump today of this <laughs> discussion? We'll see. The Q&A will goad us into something, I'm sure, that'll be interesting. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't have anything fancy like that. The lights go out. They knew, ah, he's not going to have anything from the Stone Age. But uh, and they were right. <laughs> but um, I'm going to try to build on Gatachi's focus on, on regional dynamics, where his area of expertise is. and and, and Step back a little bit, focus on U.S. policy and how that impacts and, and, and interacts with the, the EGOD process. And, and uh, to provide full context for that, I want to start, though, by, by looking just at, at, at re-looking, re-examining uh, in, in the aftermath of Gitachu's piece, just a couple of quick dynamics on the ground uh, in South Sudan and then uh, more broadly, in, and then in the region and then more broadly internationally, that uh, elements uh, that, that if addressed, can alter, potentially alter the status quo that uh, right now sees the conflict only deepening. 
This is certainly a fra fraught moment for uh, South Sudan, and I think it's driven by a few kind of unique variables, at least since the conflict erupted in, in 2013. Um, number one, the uh, incidents, the, sh the shocking atrocities that have emerged as a result of reporting uh, in the last few months by UNICEF, by Human Rights Watch, by uh, the UNMIS uh, Human Rights Department, the, these, these extraordinary stories of, of ghastly uh, attacks on civilian populations has really stirred, I think, uh, the international conscience and stiffened, perhaps enough, the backbone of the international uh, response system to try to do something more than just allowing this to continue. Um, then secondly, you have this August 17 deadline, which there have been many other deadlines in, in, during, during this last year and a half for, for, with EGOD that have come and gone with, with little fanfare and no impact. But this seems a little different um, and certainly has a lot more international support behind it. So it's worth watching much more closely than some of the others. And it certainly seems to be accompanied by a little more or a lot more international pressure uh, in support of some kind of a uh, uh, move forward or uh, movement forward on, on that August 17, by that August 17 deadline. And the third variable I think that, that makes this moment particularly fascinating is the aftermath of President Obama's trip um, and his focus clearly on this Plan B idea, you know, coming out with that, in fact, if these guys don't come to any uh, agreement, uh, then there will be much more, much stiffer consequences. And the strong rhetoric that accompanied President Obama's uh, 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 visit the strong rhetoric from National Security Advisor Susan Rice, who has been uh, uh, very uh, fixated on this uh, in, in recent months. And so I think we'll, we'll see more uh, assertive, a more assertive role for the United States than we had up till now while this war is, is burned on. So all these variables, I think, combine to create some kind of momentum for some kind of movement on August 17, but they're facing absolutely monumental obstacles, and we saw so much of that portrayed uh, on the screen just over the last 15 minutes, both inside South Sudan, within the regional dynamic, and then, of course, uh, more broadly internationally. So I'll go through real quickly all three of those and see what, and then get to some some things that might actually alter the the uh, the, uh, the the current situation. So first, within South Sudan, you know, I think that the first obstacle inside South Sudan is the nature of the state itself as it was formed and it has evolved or devolved <laughs> since uh, this formation, since the CPA and the formation of the Transitional Authority and then, of course, independence and the creation of a state. I think what the, the language we're using at, at the Enough Project is, is that of a violent kleptocracy, which is a really a, a category uh, that is, is separate from just the usual corrupt regime with some instability and conflict. It's not a state that is uh, for carrying out the normal functions of government. It's not the, a state that does what its constitution wishes it would do and hopes it will do. It, it is a hijacked state. It's been hijacked by a cabal of, uh, of competing factions of elites who have grown up over the, through this war since the 80s, uh, and that faction, those factions have hardened. They are uh, siphoning off, they have siphoned off the vast wealth of the country. It's a fairly rich country in natural resources, completely stolen uh, by, by competing elites. They can't let go of power, or they don't perceive an option of sharing or letting go of power at this juncture. Why? Because you lose the spoils. Riyak Mashar found out real quickly that that's the case. You lose immunity uh, that is afforded to you, at least up till now, there's no accountability, and you lose the patronage networks that sustain both security for your objectives, but also to allow for the plunder uh, that continues of the state and the resources of the country. So this then leads to a winner-take-all mentality, you know, a showdown between these rival kleptocratic factions that use, very cynically use ethnicity as a principal mobilizer. And that just keeps increasing divisions within society. So when you see these idiotic portrayals of South Sudan as a tribal war, 
you know, I hate this terminology. Um, it's, there's no explanation of how that comes about and who's behind that and how it's utilized for the advancement of the interests of a very small group at the top, feeding off of everyone else in the country while it goes sailing downhill. Which leads to the second obstacle directly in South Sudan, which is the fragmentation of, of command and control on both sides. Uh, we see that manifested in a number of things. We see uh, large-scale militia recruitment. Um, we see the threat of intra air conflict, both in certain areas within the greater Upper Nile region, but also in the potential showdown that if the peace agreement as written today was signed, this threat of a war between those Nuer that have supported the government and those Nuer that have supported SPLAIO. You see it in the erosion of rebel logistical lines and the pursuit of, re, of sustenance and support from Khartoum by individual commanders within the SPLIO, and then some of them being booted out uh, in the last uh, few weeks of the, of the hierarchy. You see that in the uh, complete lack of discipline in the forces of both sides uh, as witnessed by these horrific atrocities that have been committed. Um, and then you see the difficulties, uh, that's too light a word, the difficulties that humanitarian organizations face in the field um, with uh, compliance by government or SPLAO on basic agreements that have been reached related to humanitarian access or even just basic international humanitarian laws. These are all manifestation of this, uh, uh, this uh, fragmentation that is uh, becoming increasingly dangerous in terms of a spiral that South Sudan finds itself in. So that's the local uh, uh, challenge that EGOD finds itself facing. And this, the regional challenge I thought was covered very well by Gitachu, and he's in a much better position than I am, so I'll just say one thing, you know, that this, the role of Uganda and, and Sudan is, is particularly troubling in, in, in terms of how you bring about a solution in South Sudan for the reasons that Gitachu elaborated. For many South Sudanese, I can tell you from my own travels there and from our, the travels of our field people, uh, the, this problem of the neighbors, you know, uh, makes it seem somewhat like a proxy war inside South Sudan that is driving and sustaining this conflict uh, beyond the, 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 the amount of time it would have. It's burned longer than perhaps it would have had, it, had they been left to their own devices. So that's the local and the, and the regional. Now the third layer of problems and, 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 and challenges facing the the peacemakers, the EGOD peacemakers, involve the broader international dynamic. Everybody in this room knows the, the, the divisions that the United Nations Security Council uh, labors under for a number of places, not just South Sudan, and they fall along the same lines very predictably for everything, and they predictably fall along those lines for South Sudan. Miraculously, they were able to pass the authorization for some uh, sanctions there uh, you know, a month or two ago, whenever they, whenever the Security Council voted, much credit to Samantha Power and others who worked assiduously for that. But the idea that they'll go further and sanction more people, anyone's guess, Russia already was tapping the brakes at that time pretty heavily, and so the idea that they may just slam them on uh, would be, uh, would, will be interesting to see what happens. Then, uh, certainly within the international arena, the, uh, the idea that certainly has troubled EGOD from the beginning, the, which is very similar to, and a lot of these things, by the way, are hauntingly similar to some of the dynamics and problems that we saw, that we've seen over the decades with the Sudan War, but the idea of forum shopping, that the, uh, that the parties uh, not getting what they want out of a deal from EGOD look elsewhere. So they go to this Arusha process, you know, where, as we all know, the draft peace agreement for the EGOD thing has a hybrid court. There is accountability, although it's not the case in the Arusha process. So you can see why some people would say, well, let's go over there where we can all, you know, be clear. I'm not, I'm not saying one's better than the other. I'm just saying see how this opens up potential, unless it's very, very well coordinated. 
And then thirdly, there's rumblings of a South African uh, interest in, in involvement and engagement. So, of course, there are those in both the IO and, and government who would want to see that happen to create, again, escape valves, exit signs, so they don't have to get trapped in uh, agreements that they don't want. They're not corralled into agreements that they don't want by international uh, uh, cohesiveness. So that's a big problem. There's also, uh, and, 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 and Gattaccio already focused on this, but it, you've got to just mention it, there's just no consequences or accountability for any of the crimes that are committed, for any of the looting of the state resources that have occurred. So like, you know, this even they can't even get this report to be released, much less actually do something about it. So for now, uh, at this moment, you take a snapshot, there's complete impunity for everything. Um, and certainly internationally, there's a lack so far, until we heard the, 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 the phrase Plan B, of any attempt to build real leverage in support of the EGOD process. Uh, nothing has been constructed by the partners of the EGOD process, the supporters of the EGOD process internationally to influence the calculations of the warring parties. When you have a war as deep and as intense as this one and you have parties that are unwilling to compromise as we have seen over and over again, even on the basis of just simple humanitarian ceasefires, without leverage, I, I don't see any chance for a solution. So those are some pretty significant obstacles. Uh, and they require, I think, game-shifting responses to have any potential chance at progress on August 17th or beyond. So I'm going to focus on two things and hope then in the discussion th that follows that we, could, we can uh, talk about more of these kinds of ideas of how to shift it off the, the current uh, course uh, heading straight downhill. And these two areas that I would raise are high-level diplomatic engagement and then the leverage building issue. So let's first start about diplomacy. Let's start first start talking about diplomacy. I think in, in the aftermath of the of the of the trip by President Obama, there there's a need to sustain high-level engagement by the U.S. Followed up from Secretary Kerry, from from Susan Rice and others and the president by a, a telephone and other means of communication. You've got to see a, sustain, a sustainment of the UN's uh, high-level engagement that has begun now with Jan Eliasson, the Deputy Secretary General, who's, uh, you mentioned in the little introduction that I've been working on this for 30 years. I think he's been working on it for 50. <laughs> so like this guy is, you know, knows where everything is. Is, is, is buried, and so he know, he, he's, you're not going to pull the wool over his eyes. So having somebody, a, a steady hand, an experienced hand from the UN in, this, in the game is helpful to moving things forward. Of course, uh, former President Kanari is the AU special envoy, having him in the game and sustaining and, in, and ratcheting up his role, just full court press. Like, basically, the parties you know, business as usual diplomacy, which is what we were getting up till very recently, uh, uh, has been discounted completely by the regional heads of state. They do not respect it. I don't mean they, they don't like the people that come visit them, they just don't respect it. And the warring parties as well realize that, or, or basically look at the, what had been going on and realize that nobody cares enough to really get involved at a higher level, so we're okay impunity reigns. We can just keep this war going until one of us wins. And so we don't, they don't respect the business as usual style of diplomacy. And this is why if we really do want to make a difference, if there is a difference to be made, it's going to be made in part because high level diplomacy is sustained. It's unfortunate. And if it doesn't work in this round and we see it, then, then, you know, those kind of things can't go on for a long time, but this is a moment. Um, and in fact, they need to focus in particular on this nettlesome question that Katachi raised a number of times in the different aspects of his recommendations, which is the, 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 dif the differences between the neighbors, particularly Sudan and Uganda, as a catalytic element of potential peace in, in South Sudan. So then, so that's the sort of uh, uh, the, the, the regional dimension and the, and the um, I mean, the diplomatic dimension. But the, the other one, I think, uh, the one that we've focused a lot on in my organization is, 
is and an sort of the ingredient that we think is necessary for success that's completely missing from the puzzle is the building of regional and international leverage for in support of the peace process the calculations of the parties of the warring parties of the leading officials of the of the two sides of the war need to be altered uh, from pursuing war to pursuing peace because right now the cost-benefit analysis that nearly every actor in the, in the conflict uh, undergoes finds the advantages still uh, for war to still outweigh the advantages of peace for their particular interests. And that's just a basic self-interest calculation that needs to be impacted for any kind of change to happen on South Sudan. So it's our view that within, within a wider strategy, strategy of, of leverage building financial pressure and a push to secure the regional support for that kind of an approach. And it's not going to be easy. Of course it's not going to be easy. It's the hardest part of the whole equation. You've got all these assets that South Sudanese leaders have stolen from the country. I mean, money that they've stolen from the country and they've stashed in neighboring countries and some other countries in Africa and in the Middle East and, and Europe and the U.S. And you've got to start looking at those assets and, and bringing the region, particularly because a lot of the families and stuff are in the neighboring countries, um, and create an approach that really puts the squeeze on these guys, that really creates a consequence, a burning consequence, to uh, the people that have burned their own country to the ground. And um, into this mix, into that idea, I'd like to then cover the plan B for a second that, that, the, that the administration uh, certainly harped on pretty hard uh, during the last week during the last uh, uh, last week when President uh, Obama was in Ethiopia particularly and I think that the plan B is important for two reasons one for accountability now for war crimes for obstructing peace so that there's be some kind of consequence for doing that in and of itself is of value. And then secondly, because a plan B can support the negotiators to, with leverage to actually influence the uh, parties from war to peace to make compromises. That I think are the, is the, are the two uh, main uh, advantages of deploying a robust plan B. Now that the administration hasn't spelled out what is this plan B, and I think right understandably so, they want to maintain some level of of uncertainty in the part of parties so that there is hopefully some belief that this actually will be a hurting uh, response to intransigence and continued conflict. But of course there are ideas that are already floating out there about what could be, and, and I think that in the, at the very basics lens a level of analysis certainly the idea of just simply sanctioning a few more commanders uh, will not get the job done because that's normally uh, that's the usual sort of usual strategy that the US sometimes the Security Council the European Union and others pursue in response to African conflicts they go after a few of the sort of folks on the ground where there's some evidence of a war crime having been committed, these people don't have assets abroad, they don't travel internationally, and they sanction them, pat themselves on the back, and they're like, okay, we've, we've done our job. Well, that kind of a process, policy never works, <laughs> and it's why sanctions often gets a bad name, uh, uh, because it's ineffective. So in order for there to be some imp impact of a financial pressure strategy in South Sudan, you have to go after uh, the kleptocratic system that we talked about at the very beginning. The network of officials on both sides of the conflict and, the, and their enablers and their facilitators uh, who are funding and, and profiting from. I mean, there are war profiteers in many conflicts around the world. Why not South Sudan? This is what goes on. And so uh, going after the money uh, of, these, of these networks in a really serious way. You need a, I think, in no less than a transnational effort to trace and seize and then return, which is an important third component, the ill-gotten gains to the people of South Sudan. And that then vests some self-interest in the South Sudanese people realizing that, well, all of the money was stolen, but maybe some of it can come back 
for supporting development for the future of this country and the development of a real effective state rather than a kleptocratic one. And this, to end, or, or is that, I didn't, I didn't get a red flag yet. I could say <laughs> two more minutes or should I just, you could just all right. But I like I'm that. so engaged that even I forgot to say <laughs> I'm waiting for that, that flag, the red flag, the yellow flag and then the red flag. I got a lot of red flags when I played soccer. I can't imagine why. Anyways, um, let, let every basketball league I ever played in in technical fouls. The one thing I'm proud of. Three-pointers and technical fouls. Never mind. Okay, move on, move on. So our version of Plan B, if we could uh, be so lucky to have an input into what could happen. And, and again, the point is the threat of P Plan B in order to concentrate the minds of the people sitting at the negotiating table going, okay, if we, this time actually if we don't agree to something or if there isn't a credible process to move towards agreement, there will actually be a consequence <laughs> instead of this, you know, these endless threats that get made and without any backing. So for a real Plan B, to actually make an impact on the calculations of the South Sudanese on both sides. This, this is what I think needs to happen to be part of it. And there are many other things, and again, I'm eager to hear if others have views or think this is crazy, but I'll just give you five of, our, of, of a longer list. The first one is the flip side of the coin of what I said normally happens, you know, going after a few low-level commanders who commit a few atrocities and the Musa Halals of the world, and then, and, 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 and then, uh, and then walk away. So uh, going after, we, we think, going after the senior leadership on both sides with asset freezes and travel bans and then supplementing that with a, an enforced arms embargo with an aggressive mandate to track the su supplies and, the, and those that are uh, uh, brokering uh, arms transactions after a arms embargo has, has passed the Security Council. So I think a very strong move, and if the Security Council doesn't agree to it, which they probably won't in a lot of these sa sanctions things, then you work assiduously to create a coalition of countries that are willing to exact a cost uh, for, uh, for what these leaders on both sides have been doing to their people. Then the second thing that I think is an interesting thing to, 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 to put in the mix is the uh, whole arena of kleptocracy asset recovery and return. The Justice Department in the U.S. has something called the Kleptocracy Initiative that brings together a number of agencies in the U.S. And when they do bring their resources to bear, they go after uh, stolen assets in a very comprehensive way. And we think South Sudan is a perfect candidate for that. And we're going to continue to push and press for that to happen to be part of what, what goes on. And that one is where, where was, A, you can start to see real assets being swept up and then be a real debate and discussion, hopefully constructive one down the road, about how then to return those most appropriately to the country in some way, shape, or form that, that circumvents the kleptocratic structures and helps uh, go to the people who have been uh, abused by these governance, uh, governing uh, strategies. A third element of a Plan B could be a real effort to support and build the capacity of neighboring states that have an interest in complying with international uh, uh, efforts, whether it's counterterrorism efforts or whether it's the implementation of sanctions regimes on anything that the United Nations Security Council passes, but building up that capacity to implement the asset, free, the asset freezes and the, and the travel bans and other kinds of financial pressures that or pressures that could actually make a difference in, uh, in, in the calculations of, of some of the South Sudanese leaders. The fourth aspect of a Plan B we would put forward is to, um, to work with, as the U.S. reforms its own laws, to work with uh, regional states on this whole concept of beneficial ownership transparency. You know, the idea that in many, in many countries, there are protections uh, that allow people to set up companies, buy pr uh, property and assets without revealing who they are. And uh, so allowing law enforcement and other um, entities to be able to determine who are the beneficial owners of assets would be very, very important for implementing sanctions regimes. We know that many of the South Sudanese leaders 
taking the ill-gotten gains of their country, have built up and bought uh, assets in neighboring states. But they're often in other people's names or they're in trusts that have uh, that for public that publicly we cannot know who in fact owns these things. So having more transparency in the um, in ownership can actually help uh, uh, enforce some of these sanctions regimes. And then fifth and finally, um, accountability for for pillage and grand corruption. You know, I think the, the, this is what these are. These are high crimes. You know that have been committed in South Sudan since the since 2005 you know when the, when the this state you know this this nascent uh, entity transitional government was formed with no checks and balances you mentioned checks and balances and billions of dollars in oil money coming in it was a, you know i mean this is not a recipe for success and everyone was saying it at the time but it was also it helped stop a war so like there's a there's a balance you have to take, and so we obviously the ba the balance became imbalanced in favor of sadly uh, a lack of transparency, and so everything got stolen pretty much, and so uh, the hybrid court that has been proposed and other a a a elements of the of an overall strategy of getting at some of those things from within the government the, the country of South Sudan as well. I'm sure if we did polling today there would be some of the highest numbers you would get uh, among South Sudanese about whether or not they'd like to see some uh, justice done in all of the, the, the looting that has gone on by a select few people at the very top. So it's time, I, to conclude, it's time to go after the wallets, I think, um, and create a real consequence for these kleptocrats on both sides. You know, just who has access to the trough at this point is, you know, is, is irrelevant. It's, they've both been there. Uh, and they're enablers in the international system. So this isn't just about the South Sudanese, it's about all the people that also profit from misery and uh, human devastation in the chain going outward out of South Sudan and banks and insurance companies, shipping, all the other folks, that, arms dealers and other folks who are benefiting in the international system. I think if we do that, that provides, from the outside at least, the best chance for South Sudanese to, have, to make peace for their own country. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much. Get my little note here. Um, okay. Uh, so we're going to move on to the question and answer uh, portion of the event. Um, I am going to ask a couple of quick questions, but I will keep them short because I want to leave as much time as possible for questions from the audience. I know many of you here are um, experts in your own right, and we could have a very rich discussion. Um, uh, I think it's very noticeable that uh, there's a lot of uh, common elements in the comments from our two speakers today, looking at the, the issue of the individualization of power, the role of corruption in this, a number of the regional dynamics. Um, and so I, I have a, a a couple of questions uh, that I wanted to pose to you. Um, first, uh, Mr. Prendergast had talked ab about Obama's uh, uh, comments and his recent trip in Africa, and I'm curious uh, if you guys could offer your perspective on um, the uh, response that you've seen from regional leaders to that. Um, has it? Do you think it's it's that uh, the initial statements have been creating? Um, some momentum that regional leaders are responding to. Um, you know, have, have you heard rumblings? Do you think that this is moving in the right direction? Um, I'm curious uh, for you specifically, Gitachu, if, if you also wanted to talk a bit about, you know, what you would recommend a plan B looking like, um, as we've gotten a, a, quite a nice outline um, from Mr. Prendergast, if you have any additional thoughts that you want to, to add to that. Um, and then finally, um, it, let's say that this deadline is, is met and we, um, a resolution is, is attained. Um, what's the follow-up of Plan B? What should um, EGAD and the U.S. do uh, to continue to play a role in consolidating uh, peace? Or is this uh, too unlikely of a scenario to, to speculate on at this point? Um, so pick and choose whatever portions of that you'd like to answer. Um, I don't know if one of you wants to Flip go a coin. First. Who wants to go first? <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
uh, thanks. Well, uh, with uh, regard to the uh, Obama's uh, visit, especially in the Horn of Africa to Kenya and uh, Ethiopia, it was, of course, uh, a great opportunity to talk to the members of IGAD uh, in terms of dealing with the problem of South Sudan. Uh, but from academic perspective, I can see it in three uh, scenarios. And the first one is, uh, the deadline is in uh, August 17. Uh, it will uh, pass without getting some kind of uh, any result, like what happened in March 6 uh, deadline. This is one scenario, and therefore the problem will continue as it is and people will suffer and the country will uh, remain uh, in a problem. And the second scenario is uh, with regard to the uh, statement that was forwarded, uh, that's sanction. And uh, the sanction uh, is not clear, of course, but if the sanction is on the same to like what happened in the generals uh, below the big officials of South Sudan, Still, uh, the problem uh, is continue. It, it will be continuing, but uh, uh, to some extent, to some extent, uh, there will be uh, some kind of frustration on the leaders. But still, I don't think so. That will resolve uh, drastically the problem of South Sudan. The third scenario is uh, uh, following the deadline. If uh, the international community, the African Union. Uh, and uh, Turkey countries, as well as uh, the other international partners, use s very strong stick uh, against uh, the leaders of South Sudan. Uh, that will bring a drastic uh, change in the country. Therefore, I can see from three different scenarios, especially in, in, in with regard to approaching the problems of South Sudan uh, in, in connecting with uh, Obama's uh, trip. Uh, in in the, with regard to uh, the plan B, uh, I think uh, the plan B uh, to me uh, is uh, the plan A itself. That's using strong power to 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 uh, uh, resolve the existing problem, uh, because uh, you know the the conflict in parties they agree today uh, and they broke uh, their agreement tomorrow. Uh, so this is, I think, the culture that they are using in South Sudan. Unless there is a very strong uh, measure, it's not only just taking, uh, uh, you know, sanctions, embargoes on the military generals, even to the extent of, you know, trying to exclude the uh, leaders of the two uh, fighting groups. That that that's very important because if if they come to agreement, I think I don't think so that will be sustainable for the future unless there is sustainable and drastic changes in the governance system as a whole. Uh, unless we think about inclusive uh, peace process. Uh, I think we are thinking about the status quo. If the, the, those guys come into agreement, we are, we are, we are saying that uh, they have to come back to their own, the previous status quo. So th there must be a fundamental change in the security uh, sector, in the military sector, in the governance system, as well as in, in the uh, discussion as well, in the peace process as well. Therefore, uh, my, my suggestion with regard to Plan B is that of Plan A itself. Thank you. I like it. All right. Uh, Mr. Pernigas. That's great. Um, I, you know, I think Plan B is, is, is music to none of these leaders' ears. I don't think they, uh, you know, b sort of continuing the diplomatic process and everybody's just used to doing this and they just do it endlessly on a number of different conflicts uh, regionally and you know and and uh, they're used to the them taking years and years to, to make progress and so I think when somebody comes flying in from outside and starts throwing around this kind of language I think it's very destabilizing to the to the order uh, and uh, I think particularly President Museveni was galled by it um, uh, you know, and, and, and which puts a very, very interesting uh, moment of competing foreign policy priorities for the United States, you know, as we seek to increase our uh, engagement with Uganda on uh, counterterrorism in Somalia with Shabab and as we uh, 
continue a somewhat successful, slowly but surely successful mission uh, eroding the capacities of the LRA uh, in, throughout Central Africa. You know, at the same time, the act of President Museveni is getting a little old on this South Sudan stuff. He's becoming perceived increasingly as, a, as a, an obstacle uh, to peace as much as any of the leaders in South Sudan. And so, you know, I don't know where, I don't know what, you know, that, that's when you started to make your calculations, you know, as policymakers uh, uh, in the U.S. I don't know what the calculation is going to be on Museveni and whether they lean on him hard for South Sudan or whether they go, you know what, the other things are more important, so we'll slap them on the wrist or whatever the hell they do when they don't really mean it. Send somebody to give them a demarche mellow. And, uh, you know, and it's called a day and say, that got it, those regional dynamics are tough, aren't they? So, um, you know, I, that's, that's what I, and I'm from the warring parties, particularly with this, this governor, governor of South Sudan, of course, they are, you know, very upset about Sa President Salva not being invited to the meeting and then this Plan B thing, which they view aimed at them more because disproportionately. Uh, uh, and then, of course, the arms embargo it would be clearly disproportionately impacting the, the government. So that, I think they just feel like this is a real abandonment and all this rest of this stuff. So it's an interesting uh, reaction on the part of the region and in the warring parties. On the 17th, you know, I, I don't think it's science fiction to, to, to uh, envision a possible scenario where these parties decide, let's sign something, you know, and see what happens. We can kick the ball down the field. Maybe, maybe the pressure's off later. And so, uh, you know, therefore, so the, your question was, what do you do with Plan B? And that's sort of, you, you create, I think, and I, you know, it's really, I, I, I'm not a crystal ball gazer, so I'm like, I'm not giving you percentages on that one, but I think it's not impossible. But if it does happen, then you know you, you keep cultivating and creating this set of pressures, and then when and if, and it's more when than if, there is uh, backsliding or non-implementation or breakage of the agreement that was signed by one or the other party or both, then you can start to deploy these, these instruments of consequence uh, much more rapidly than you would if you weren't prepared. So I would keep that on high alert, let's say, <laughs> if there is an agreement. I think that's what you're asking, if there is an agreement, you know. Uh, but if, you know, and, but at the same thing, you know, this is where you walk and chew gum as a diplomat, you, 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 you do that, but you'd also try to support the implementation of the agreement, whatever the thing is when it's actually signed. Um, you know, if EGOD Plus puts it down and if these parties agree to whatever that is, even though all of us in this room will think it's a grossly inadequate agreement that's easily manipulated and undermined, if it can get, if, there's a huge if, it can bring about a diminution of the, of the conflict on the ground, uh, then, then how do we play a role in supporting that would be obviously an intense uh, U.S. focus. Um, and and uh, I think we would argue based on what we've just been talking about with respect to the kleptocratic element of things, that building up a real capacity for transparent governance, you know, using the, the assets, the resources of the state in a way that benefits the people instead of lining the pockets of these criminals, uh, I think is really the, the, uh, the, the, the area where some of international support could really make a difference along with that hybrid court. You know, building up the capacities for uh, justice, and you wrote down SSR and DDR at some point in your presentation. I mean, you know, reforming institutions that have been hijacked. I mean, it's just so fundamental to state transformation, to conflict transformation in, in Africa and anywhere in the world throughout history. So, and, 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 and SSR and DDR and other acronyms are part and parcel of a larger strategy that would help to uh, move uh, uh, the, the, the very diseased and hijacked state that exists now into some semblance of a, 
an effective state that actually takes care of its people and secures their um, their daily needs. So, right. All right, let's open it for questions from the audience. Um, a couple of ground rules. Please introduce yourself, including both your name and your affiliation, uh, so our speakers know who's addressing them. Um, please limit yourself to very brief comments uh, or one question. Uh, as those who've come to our events before will know, I have three older brothers. I will cut you off. Um, and I'll take three questions at a time and let our, our uh, speakers respond to that. Um, so uh, um, Ann Phillips here in the front. Um, we'll take the woman right next to her, um, and some, uh, we'll go in the back there. Uh, thank you, Ann Phillips, uh, USIP. I used to work for the U.S. government, and uh, quick question. Uh, the U.S. government considered itself something of a midwife for South Sudan, really focused on South Sudan before the CPA, helping to build up institutions after the CPA until the referendum. Uh, <laughs> for independence, which was obviously a unifying factor. So what was the U.S. government missing in all that assistance prior to 2005 that's going to be different if and when a peace agreement is reached uh, between the warring parties or among the warring parties now? Thank you. Great question. Thank you. My name is Bola Feni. I'm with the University of Texas System. I noticed a reluctance you know, on the panel of recommending military action. And we have been down this road before. I remember um, um, Liberia. You know, the African Union had to intervene and get things moving in that country. So my question really is, I believe that they're going to kick the can down the road. They're going to sign some agreement that is not implementable. So why this reluctance to recommend some kind of support for the African Union to do what they need to do? Thank you. Good. And uh, Mark Summers in the back. Hi, this is Mark Summers. I'm a consultant and actually a former fellow here at the Wilson Center. Um, just a quick question. I was on a flight to Nairobi about a year ago, and uh, the person I was speaking to was involved in uh, the negotiations at that time in uh, Addis Ababa with both sides in South Sudan for the negotiations. And she said something really interesting that I just wanted to ask um, both of the speakers about. And that was about the personalities of the, of the two leaders. And she said that Machar, if he signs an agreement, he's finished as a newer leader. That there are so many people underneath him who are benefiting from the war, that if he signs, he's finished. So the, him signing uh, an agreement s struck her as very unlikely. And on the other side, she found that working with Kier, he's a very erratic personality. And, he, and, and it's very hard to get him to follow through on things that he says he's going to do because you start all over again the next time you see him. And she said that she was very, very down on the, process, on the prospects of getting a negotiation if these two personalities are at the forefront of the negotiation process. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Great. So we have a question about uh, sort of what was the U.S. missing uh, before, and, and are we paying attention to that now? Um, the, uh, should there be a recommendation for military action? Um, and then the role of the, the uh, personality of the two leaders, and, and to some extent by extension, is, is there any solution that does not involve them as the, the principal uh, negotiators? So I get to go first? I'll let you yeah. go first. <laughs> So um, to, to your question, Ann, I think, um, what, what did the U.S. miss? You know, uh, first, I think, I'm, uh, now I'm going to sound like a broken record skipping, but, I mean, there was, they stole everything. There was mass corruption. It was a kleptocracy. We built these institutions, but the institutions were being hijacked in order to service the plunder and secure the power for those that are in, I mean, unless you address that core, political problem like we were great at the institutional technocratic like i i'm quite sure these beltway bandits that are go and do these wonderful contracts to build up the capacity of different ministries all over the world do a great job technically it doesn't mean anything if politically the termites are just eating the foundation out from under the place i just don't get that entire strategy of governance building it's crazy, frankly. It's a waste of my money as a taxpayer. So I'm mad. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> like, they took my money and spent it on in other people's accounts now. 
Hmm. So that's a problem. Like, that's the problem. And then there was the, the, the so it's really back to those two levels. The, 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 what do you do about the financial stuff? And then diplomacy. Like, there was a moment, and I think Princeton Lyman was a phenomenal envoy, and he worked very, very hard, and then he was done. And it was January, February, I don't remember, 2000, I'm going to get them all wrong, 2013, 20, 2000, when, when did this war start? December 2013. So he finished in like January 13 or February 13 or something like that. Spring, you know, maybe the first blade of grass was coming through the ground in spring 2013. And he was finished. Like he had given him some extra months. The Obama administration had plenty of time. I mean, he was telling him a year before that that he was finishing. And it wasn't until the fall and the leaves are changing. And these guys are already, I mean, as you, when you take off that daily hourly engagement that that's sta like in other words if you're not going to address the root causes at least engage 24 7 to stop things from going haywire and we were not we were not involved like you can't do this kind of work just through an ambassador and just through an embassy there has to be i'm a big strong believer in special envoyism <laughs> so you're either in one camp or you're in another i'm in that one and <clears throat> we were not present at a senior level when the you know what hit the fan within the SPLN M during the uh, during the 2013. There it is. So by the time Booth shows up, like it's a done deal. Like these guys are squared off. They're recruiting heavily in their uh, militias, their private militias, they whatever they call them, presidential this or price presidential. Like a, all just a cover for being private militias from your own hometown. Um, and then those, then the war begins. So, like, I think those two aspects were really like are great lessons for America. <laughs> Not to if you if if in fact you are going to look at this as a legacy issue, or if people are going to paint it as a legacy issue of the Obama administration, going back to the Bush administration, going back to the Clinton administration, rightly so, because there's been a great investment by three straight to support some kind of positive evolution in this place. And uh, then 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 those are two pretty big things to remember when you post August 17th or of this year or 10 years from now, whenever this war ends, you could, uh, you could keep in mind these things and, and do a lot better than what happened. On Ebola's question of, of AU military action, I'm glad you raised it. You know, I think, um, um, I don't, I, I think in many, most of these places, um, when there's an act of war of this magnitude, uh, I, 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 I personally do not think that there that you'd have a great you'd stand a great deal of success inserting an intervention force into that volatile cocktail especially with logistics being as insane as they are in south sudan and with the rainy season cutting off six to eight months of of resupply and it would be so crushingly expensive and so few nations would send their troops into that killing zone. Like, I don't see that as a, as a viable first step. But I do, and I, I know you're probably going, oh, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Then, but I do think that, uh, that uh, if there is even a semblance of a deal, let's, let's go with your um, scenario that in fact they sign something just to sign it because they're sick and tired of everybody yelling at them and they think they'll get they'll be able to get away from it a month or six months from now then i would say that eastern congo uh the minusco uh option becomes a very interesting one the idea of a what they called the fib the force intervention brigade uh which was in south africa tanzania and um maybe there's a is jim still here which was the third country I don't know who the third country is. I'm very sorry if the, if somebody's listening from that country when you've sent your valuable soldiers there. But there was three countries. They went into Eastern Congo, which, by the way, isn't you know uh, 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 at the time when the M23 was raising hell, not a, not a picnic, and uh, with a quite substantial uh, military effort, uh, along with many other things, lots of diplomatic pressure on Kagame, the the whole conflict of minerals thing, which is another issue of interest and divisiveness, but nevertheless was a way that defunded some of these militias. And, um, and that for intervention brigade was very helpful in defeating a spoiler. 
So in other words, I think as part of UNMIS Plus, post some agreement someday, there has to be some component uh, that's led by the AU, but certainly welcome international, broader than African forces if people are willing to supplement a, an effort that could go after spoilers in a very serious way. Then the third uh, question, hey Mark, how you doing? Haven't seen you in a while. You still there? There you are, sorry, I'm blind as a bat. You gotta like start waving like an air traffic controller for me to know you're there. Um, uh, okay, interesting plane co conversations you have, I see. You are still the same as when I knew you before. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, I think, just quick, that could be the case, you know, like that, that's a conventional wisdom if I was like a, a sort of lazy, and I don't mean to imply your plane person, if I was like a CIA, what do you call those people, the, 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 the profiler, I'd like probably say those things about those two leaders, you know, if I was trying to figure out their psychology. But, but hey, Riek Mishar uh, initiated a rebellion within the SPLA in 1991. Some of the worst atrocities in the war were committed between 1991 and 1993 at his direction. Uh, he then, after receiving government of Sudan aid to fight against the South Sudan rebels, he used to be part of, he then joined the government of Sudan and had an office in some garage outside the presidential palace in Khartoum. So like, you got as far away as you possibly can from being in, having any legitimacy left in, in, in sort of conventional uh, rebellion, let's say liberation theology of South Sudan. I mean, 1998, he signs a deal with Garang. He's back in the fold. They're working together. Like, I'm not saying they were best buds hanging around going to drink every night, but they, he, they have a tradition. There is a, there are example after example of shockingly uh, 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 impressive, in my view, uh, willingness on the part of former leaders who have uh, committed some incredible uh, atrocities against the, the, their former or their erstwhile ally coming back together and working it out and figuring it out for the, to get to get to the next thing and so like I don't think it's impossible that he signs a deal that he works through with some of the commanders all of whom were posturing now saying if you make this deal I'm, I mean Salva got in front of his audience the other day and said well no way we're going to sign this thing we'll see you know I mean, people posture to their domestic constituencies. Anyway, I went one time, I remember this is 1987. Uh, oh, that's perfect. I think it'll take me that long um, <laughs> to tell this. 1987, uh, in the middle of nowhere, Garang had just gone on an international tour talking about unity in so uh, the country of Sudan and, you know, getting the, 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 the Africans and uh, Mugabe and all these people to give him money so that he could fight for the democracy and the... And then he, I, I accompanied him, I didn't accompany him, I went into an area where he was there and he was doing the speech for his troops and he was like, I'm just bullshitting them all. I want an independent country, stick with me, this is what I gotta do. So like, whatever, you know, like this stuff, they, they come together, they'll do what they have to do, they to get money, to get support, to get pressure off of you, and then, it's up to us, once there is that kind of a deal, to then work on the root causes. The South Sudanese people are working on them. There's all kinds of civil society groups. There are reformist politicians in many of the political parties. Like, I'm not saying this is some external project to fix South Sudan. Hell no. 99.9% .9 of the progress will come because South Sudanese are trying to make these changes on the ground, trying to make their government more transparent. That's a Western agenda? No. That's a South Sudanese agenda, saying don't steal everything. Because it, it would be nice if we had a government that functioned like it says in the Constitution it's supposed to, in the South Sudanese Constitution. So I think that's an agenda of South, and we need to get behind that. Um, and with Salva, I mean, this is, okay, you could, write, you could say these things about his, his um, uh, you know, uh, the, the erratic nature of things, but, uh, but I also think that he's a guy who has, at, in the past, has made substantial compromises days after he said he'd never make substantial compromises in order to just move the ball down the hill. And, and again, it then becomes, what do you do once that compromise is made? So I, I am not doubting that these guys can do, can make a deal. I'm highly doubting whether the international community, the region, and local civil society and other pro 
reform movements within South Sudan can combine to ensure that this time when they make that deal, it actually produces something better fruit than the strange fruit that has been produced by past agreements. All right. Um, okay. Kutachi, go ahead. Uh, I think almost uh, John touched on everything. Well, with regard to the uh, military intervention, uh, basically uh, it will not be uh, impossible especially to intervene in, in South Sudan. Uh, given the UNAMIS uh, there, because we have a huge number of uh, United Nations mission in the South Sudan. So it, it can play an important role in terms of you know, trying to uh, deal with existing uh, problem on the ground. Uh, so the United Nations Security Council and the African Union, uh, if they have good will in resolving the problem of South Sudan, uh, I think uh, uh, this is not something difficult uh, to, uh, to, to engage with the problem. So uh, 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 there is a, a kind of division within, uh, to my understanding, there is kind of division within the Security Council itself in trying to deal with the problem of South Sudan. Uh, for example, uh, China is, uh, uh, it is a huge uh, investor in South Sudan in terms of oil. Uh, uh, again, the competition between U.S. and uh, Russia by itself is not uh, simple. So I think this kind of uh, division by itself is a serious problem in trying to have the uh, same goal in resolving the problem of South Sudan. And the same is true within the African Union itself. Uh, I think uh, the, the Sudan by itself is a big uh, country uh, within, uh, it's, it's considered as a big uh, country within the African Union itself, who an uh, old uh, guard of the African Union, and the Mosoveni is also the other one who is playing important role there, and uh, the uh, chairman uh, of Mugabe is also there, and therefore it, is, it seems to be very challenging uh, to the African Union itself to unify itself to deal with the problems of South Sudan. Therefore, there is a kind of ill ill will and dealing with uh, this pervasive war. Uh, so uh, it seems to be uh, division within the members uh, of the African Union as well as the United Nations itself. Uh, the other one is with regard to personalities. Uh, th that's why I'm suggesting that the existence of these two uh, personalities will not resolve the problems of South Sudan in general. As far as they are trying to struggle for their own interest, for their own political and economic uh, power game rather than the interest of the society. Uh, so the African Union uh, has institutionalized the African Union Commission of Inquiry to investigate the violations of human rights, the war atrocities, and so on and so forth. So I think it has to uh, release it from which we can clearly see that uh, those people will not be you know, uh, credible leaders of the South Sudan people uh, as, as they are fighting for their own uh, sharing of power. 45-55, they are saying that. The other says, I need 60, the other says 45, and the other said 50, and therefore this is a game of just having, you know, trying to uh, use the economic and the political power of South Sudan to, to oppress the other people, especially after some time of the agreement. So there must be fundamental uh, uh, reframing of the peace process again. That's what, what I want to suggest in terms of. So no need of just seeing those two persons in terms of you know, uh, involving in the peace process. That's my, my uh, personal suggestion. Okay, um, I wanted to take another round of questions, but I'm cognizant that we are already over time and I wanna be respectful of everyone's time here. Uh, so I hope that everyone uh, who still has, has burning questions can stick around for a few minutes afterwards um, and hopefully our speakers will be available as well uh, to continue the conversation out in the lobby. Um, so thank you so much to both of our speakers and to everyone in the audience for your fantastic questions. Uh, please join me in thanking them. <laughs>